Right now, it is time to bring in uh, the uh, friends of ours from the Lakeville Journal, Janet Manko and Cynthia Hosswinter. Good morning. Good morning. Good, Good morning. All right. Uh, nice little surprise, a little little bit of snow out there, but we've got more on the way starting around uh, noontime till about noontime tomorrow. So Unpredictable. <laughs> it's unpredictable. All right. That's life nowadays, unpredictable. We can all be happy we're not in Texas. Um, you know, we can... <laughs> We complain about Eversource. Yeah, yeah. You can really see about a power company to complain in Texas and California. <laughs> so just be, hold that in your minds the next time you complain about Eversource. Yeah. All, you know, it's really, uh, it, it's, it really is true. We, we take a lot of things for granted. Uh, and uh, we basically, uh, our power companies do a pretty good job here and don't fail um, on a huge capacity like this every two or three years. Right. Now, you know, the conditions in Texas now, we think of those conditions as, you know, winter conditions. And boy, those uh, repair people from Eversource get out there yeah. in all kinds of weather, and uh, it's not easy. Yeah. Let's go right to the front page when we start talking about what are a nice picture there, a jumper's eye view. The uh, 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 Of course, Jump Fest went on as planned. Uh, they even streamed it live, and uh, it was successful for them. I showed up at the Jumps on Saturday just as they reached capacity, and and I, they were nice enough to say we could get in because we were pressed, but um, I didn't want to take a space from people that really you know had planned a day around it. So I went home and watched the live stream, and it was great. Um, really nicely filmed, and as you know, there's always a lot of downtime between jumps, and it does allow you to go off and make some cocoa or do something. But a lot of people turned out, and I think it must have been I think it was frustrating for the Salisbury Winter Sports Association to have to turn people away. But at the same time, I think they must have been very gratified by the people who, you know, 50 deep were willing to stand in line on, you know, not a horribly cold day, but certainly not warm weather and wait to get in and take part in the excitement of the annual Jump Fest. And they had great weather conditions. There was no anxiety this year about the snow. It was almost as though the weather said, we know you're worrying about enough stuff. We'll just make sure that there's perfect snow and perfect conditions for you. So, so um, another yeah. successful uh, Swasa Jump Fest. All right. Uh, right below that, seeing as we're on the winter tone before we go to some other stories, uh, there will be a winter sports season. Uh, the CIAC, the Connecticut Health Department, the CDC all got together, and uh, there will be uh, some sort uh, uh, of winter sports season going on for, for athletes at high school. And for um, Speaking of people who maybe are not as fully appreciated as they ought to be for the effort they make, Ann McNeil, the athletic director, for the high school, but also really for the region at this point, has worked very hard. And it's hard enough to schedule all these matches and all these practices for all the different teams. There's boys' teams, there's girls' teams, there's buses, there's a lot to, to organize. And so this year, Ann McNeil is having to really scramble to find places not only for competitions and to work with the other coaches on um, opportunities for them to play against each other, but also just to find places to practice so that the hockey team is now driving all the way down to Simsbury which, of course, has the, you know, Olympic-quality rinks down there, which will be a treat. But, you know, pretty nice when you have the Olympic-quality rinks at Salisbury and the Hotchkiss available to you, too. So a very interesting story from Hunter Lyle that starts off with him saying, describing the, um, the game against the Nanawag Chiefs last week where the students had to stop and take a mask off break to catch their breath. And really people have given it a lot of thought and come right into this winter season thinking about what's best for the athletes. So Hunter does a nice job describing what the different protocols are going to be for the different sports this year. All right. And something that I think a lot of people have overlooked. I mean, we have covered, and the high school administration has done an outstanding job, not only here, but all the high schools and all the school districts around us, in coming up with plans and following those plans and keeping going, keeping school going one way or another. But one thing we don't really uh, focus in on, and you focus in with Patrick Sullivan's story, on how the teachers at Housatonic Valley Regional High School are adapting on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis with COVID-19. And one of the nice things about having a reporter like Patrick, who's been here for many, many years now and really knows a lot of the people in the community, is there were three teachers that he spoke to who are doing very different styles of teaching and learning and talked to them about the complexity of sometimes being in the classroom, sometimes being at home. Some of the teachers are only remote. And it's a lot, I mean, again, when you talk about scheduling, and again, Lisa Carter, such a treasure, our new superintendent, it's hard enough to do scheduling when everybody's in the building. But when you've got, you know, the days 
when the schools open, the days when the schools close, there's cleaning, there's athletics, there's buses, there's kids that are coming in, there's teachers that are coming in, there are teachers that are not coming in. It's a lot to organize. So Patrick talked to three different teachers about how they're coping. And they're really, you know, not that there would ever be whining, but really no whining. Just like, this is what we're doing, and we're making it work. And what's most important, as Anne McNeil says about winter sports, is let's make sure that this is a great experience for the students. Yeah, and, uh, and I give them a lot of credit. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a tough time for everybody. We know in media, newspapers, or radio, uh, any job, it's, it's tough with COVID-19. Uh, but teaching, which is such, such an integral part of, especially uh, the grammar schools, uh, heads off to the teachers. Now, let's get some, some good news in here. And you've got a nice picture of uh, Dean, Dean, <laughs> Dean <laughs> Dino's. Uh, and I, I like that. Uh, you, got, you got, Cynthia, you got him right in the middle of a toss. I think that is really an amazing picture. <laughs> Dean is an incredible guy. And actually, you know, I, thank you for reminding me because I made a movie of him tossing the dough. And I'll post it on our Instagram today to promote the story. But Dean is so great and so lovely. And actually, um, longtime hockey coach for Hootsonic Valley Regional High School and just a lovely guy. And one of the many pizza place owners that we have in the area, we have summer intern ones who want, the first story he wanted to do was, how can a town as small as North Canaan support three pizzerias? And of course, Salisbury, about the same size, also has three pizzerias. So Deb Alexina said a very funny story, and fascinating actually, about whether Connecticut is going to vote in pizza as its state food. And I looked online, and as far as I could tell, most other states have a fruit or a vegetable as their state food. Like even New York has the their state food, of course, is the apple. And if you look, you know, certain states will have specialty foods. Like I think in New Orleans, there's some kind of um, a sandwich, not a muffalata, but something else, or you know, like jambalaya. There's all all sorts of sort of ethnic foods that are of particular you know interest and are listed as a state food. So presumably pizza will uh, count as that for Connecticut. But that very funny called up um, pizzerias in New York. And, of course, got their opinion on whether Connecticut has better pizza or not. So really worth reading. And um, I don't even like pizza that much. And I'll tell you, after you read the story, you're going to definitely be on the phone ordering a pizza from your favorite pizzeria. Well, what's interesting about the state of Connecticut is that uh, really there is a battle between uh, New York and, and Connecticut for uh, the first pizzeria, uh, uh, Frank Pepe's, uh, which yep. now uh, his whole family has different pizzerias, Pepe Pizzeria with the same and when you go down there and you have their pizza, you see that it's not called pizza. It's called tomato pie, and then you add stuff <laughs> on top of it. But you're right. When you come to our area out in the middle of nowhere, it seems when no matter what town you go in, there's a couple pizzerias. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really is well, an accepted food in the state, almost like grinders, because grinders are just available everywhere. That's, right. uh, that's the amazing thing about pizzas. They are available everywhere. But very little Chinese food in this region. But, you know, as this debate goes on, I'll just say, I'm from Chicago, so, you know, you all can just take a back seat. Well, then now you've got <laughs> Detroit style, uh, Chicago style. It's, <laughs> pizza, who and then there's California. That's right. Who <laughs> thinks that would pizza would be that? Well, anyways, uh, yeah, it's, it's a so great simple. story. And Connecticut should have pizza as its, uh, as its state food. I, I don't think there's any doubt about Completely it. Completely agree. All right. Um, you've got a story on paying for recycling costs and uh, also Eversource efforts to do better in the future. Right. And so that's the COG, which is um, our regional first selectman from 21 towns. And I think, Janet, there's a letter in this week's paper. Maybe it's next week's about it, it the was COG. The, the, yeah, right. About COG. So the COG is a, is a very interesting organization. There's two different parts to it. One is the administration of the COG, which is you know within the office in Goshen. But one is just the 21 first selectmen who get together once a month to discuss issues that are of common and then talk about things like grants because they'll take turns applying for grants depending on who needs the money and they'll help them with the grant money. Um, so they were talking about recycling and, you know, complexities of that, but also Eversource. And, you know, I would say COVID is a fairly anxious time for all of us. There's a lot of uncertainty and we're all spending way too much time um, sitting at home thinking. And one of the things that really bothered people that Eversource did on um, last August with Hurricane, with Tropical Stormy's Eyes was that they didn't really communicate well to the towns about what was going on, and that made people completely anxious. So one of the things they're um, vowing to do, and I think that they've, you know, as far as I can tell, they're trying to do a pretty good job this winter, is just to communicate better and give people a better idea of what exactly is going on. Because this is New England. People can cope with a lot. They just kind of want to know, you know, how long is it going to be? How bad is it? Can I report to you that my power is out? Yeah, it's, uh, but, you yeah, know, it's, when you look at it, um, <laughs> We're, we're kind of used to this, uh, and even though we grumble and complain, we get through it. 
But we have to, when you look at all these places that get unexpected uh, snow and ice, and they don't have plows. Uh, no tires. It's, it's just amazing. It's absolutely amazing. What's good? You forget that driving in snow is, a, is an art and that it's something that you've learned to do and that if you've never really driven even a quarter inch of snow, if you don't know how to drive in it, it's really disruptive. Absolutely. Uh, nice story uh, about uh, Fairfield Farm Sustainable Agriculture. Right, Leela Hawken um, covered, and we love it, on Zoom. A nice talk by Amy Sidron. And I think that anybody who lives in this region drives by Fairfield Farm all the time. It's on that stretch of Route 41 where the Sharon and Salisbury borders meet. And it's this beautiful big farm. It was a beautiful farm when it was owned by um, Jack Blum for many years. And then he's a Hotchkiss alumnus. He, he passed along that, that property and a conservation easement to the Hotchkiss School. And it seemed in the beginning like, you know, it was going to be sort of a, a novelty and that occasionally they would you know, sell some potatoes or, or serve some salads at the school. But they're really doing a lot of production, um, partly under the guidance of Alan Cockerline from Whipper Will Farm in Salisbury. But Amy really talked about the thousands and thousands of pounds of food that they're producing, not just for the dining hall, but also for our local food pantry. So really a wonderful use of a local agricultural asset. Now, Hotchkiss doesn't take on tasks uh, lightly, and they involve the students in everything so heavily. I'm always amazed when I speak to the students uh, uh, that are there uh, and the administrators, how anybody has time for anything in Hotchkiss is amazing. Yeah. Uh, Cornwall, PNZ, their forum on the 10-year uh, plan of development. I always say, like, like a broken record, the town plan of conservation and development is the most important document that every town comes up with because it determines what your town is going to look like. It's the basis for the planning and zoning regulations. So Cornwall takes it very seriously. The state requires towns to update their town plan every 10 years. They've just completed this round of the um, town plan. They're already starting to plan for their next one in 10 years. And, of course, what they'll do next is they'll go into the planning and zoning regulations and they'll begin to adapt. But most of the towns are, are fairly consistent in saying they don't want light industry. They want large um, plots or residential properties, and um, they want to retain the rural charm and beauty of our area. Uh, and under that, uh, the Swift House and speeding uh, was a discussion in Kent. Yeah, Swift House is a public, it's a town on building and had really fallen into disuse. And, um, you know, Leela kind of obliquely refers to it, but there was a lot of rodents living in the building. And it had been a building that was available for um, a lot of town uses. So they finally are taking a moment now. And I think that, like, you know, I don't know this, but this indicates to me that this means there's a little bit of extra wiggle room in the budget. And of course, we're moving into budget season now. And, you know, we'll see how towns did. But if anything good can come out of the COVID quarantine, let's hope that towns are able to save a little bit of money and then put it into things like Swift House that are essential, but that maybe um, fall fairly low on the list. All right. The triangle traffic plan and the human element. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is that little triangle over at Route 7. Um, not when you pass the, um, the historic cover bridge, but the, the concrete bridge that connects Sharon and Cornwall that I think people maybe don't even realize they're crossing as they go there. There's a little gas station Richard Bramwell's liquor store, and that's really in a more of a town green than you realize it is for Cornwall. This is where they have the Black Lives Matter protest. This is where they have their Christmas tree. And so the state, those are state highways that, that create that triangle there. And so the state is coming in and saying, we think we're going to redo how the traffic goes there. And people in town are saying, actually, we'd like to have some say in this because it is a place that's used by a lot of people. Let's make sure that it's safe and that it, uh, it, that it suits our needs as well as the state. Well, it's interesting how the green has changed in the past 10 years because you now have a, a very active, you got a very active grocery store and, uh, and also uh, the senior, the, the affordable housing, the senior affordable housing that's there. So there are a lot of people that cross around that area now. And besides the, tr the, the automobile traffic, there is a lot more human traffic around there than there ever was. Right. All right. I like it. The ice finally got in at Lakeville Lake. <laughs> it went in, but I was um, snowshoeing with my friend Ann yesterday around the edges of the lake, and it's starting to, you know, soften up a little bit. And when you're out on that lake, it makes the most extraordinary noises, as though there were oh, yeah. the Loch Ness monster were under the water and had just eaten some spicy food. It's very kind of blurpy, not really cracky, but um, a reminder to everybody: just because the ice is in, it doesn't mean that there aren't soft spots. So don't go out into the center of those lakes unless you are really experienced with um, the ice here. And make sure you bring your ice picks because people do fall through almost every year in one of these water bodies. As a and kid, I used to hate to go out ice skating. We had a pond that did the same thing. Once it got frozen over, 
the noise it was almost like wails and screech yeah. it, it really was and uh, my my brothers and sisters would go out there in the evening i wouldn't <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've got a great a great uh, picture essay about uh, the salisbury winter sports association but also uh, another pretty uh, big guy in our area has passed away uh, and that is of course ron jones ron jones and he and ed kirby who passed away um, about a week ago Really very linked, the two of them, big historians, really active guys. Um, Tom Shackman has a story, a little appreciation he wrote for next week, in which he says, Ron Jones is a fireman, and if he joined your nonprofit board, you knew that whatever needed to get done was going to get done. An amazing guy, worked very closely with Ed Kirby in um, not only reviving the Beckley Furnace, which is a big historic site around here, but Ron was essential to the creation of this region as a federal heritage area. Really lovely guy, very courtly. He used to be in our office, I'd swear, I swear about once a week visiting with Janet. He'd come in in his, his track suit and gracious, elegant, smart. So, again, a big loss to the region, both him and um, Ed Kirby, and of course, Roach about uh, six months ago. Yeah, all right. Uh, we want to go on to the opinion and editorial page. First of all, we'll start off with the editorial, Janet, uh, celebrating an iconic resource in Cornwall. Right. Uh, it's amazing to think that a little town uh, paper could survive for 30 years, but the Cornwall Chronicle is indeed celebrating its 30th anniversary, and it's really been an extraordinary publication for this town. And, it's a un you know, all our towns are unique, but Cornwall has three separate hamlets that really do need to have communication happen, and... Thirty years ago, um, the idea to start up this town paper really made a difference, I think, to uh, the way Cornwall has remained cohesive. And, you know, now we have the Internet, we have uh, different ways that the towns stay in touch, but that chronicle, you know, people still love to see it show up, and they read it online, and it's a great resource. And we talk about, yeah, the way Cornwall has... Um, evolved and continues to have sort of a bit of a renaissance in West Cornwall now. And it, Cornwall Bridge has been active all along, as you were pointing out, Marshall. It's a great little town, and congratulations to all the writers, all those volunteers, professionals uh, uh, of all kinds, um, putting out that Cornwall cro Chronicle once a month for 30 years. And I am just blown away by the letters. Uh, you've got letters uh, on two different letters, uh, one on the Nature Conservancy uh, explaining that. Also, Tim Abbott uh, with, a, uh, with a very good response on land trust and, and other, other letters. I mean, those letters continue to come in uh, during this cabin fever time. It is, uh, yeah, and people are taking their time and really thinking about what they want to say, so we're glad to have the letter from Tim talking about trusting land trust because we did have a letter um, questioning that, and he gives all the reasons why you can trust them. Uh, we do have uh, another letter from the Nature Conservancy, Andrew Benson, on uh, their position in um, talking about uh, land trusts and the ease conservation easements. Uh, and we also, as Cynthia mentioned, Eric Mason is writing about Salisbury residents deserving transparency, and he talks about the Northwest Council of Governments quite a bit. Um, yeah, uh, just and a, a couple more that really have great ideas and uh, get you thinking. So let them read them, think about it, and write us a letter. Uh, and uh, and uh, you're, you're uh, uh, Peter Riva with results from a political trial. The domestic terrorism threat uh, is not Antifa. I mean, uh, it's, it's, this is one page that hasn't slowed down with the winter months, Janet. <laughs> no, and, you know, that's because our lives haven't really slowed yeah. down. There, There's a lot to think about and write about, and our readers do that, so we're grateful for that. All right, and, uh, Cynthia, we can take a look, uh, of course, at the next Nothing. segment. Unexpectedly, still so much activity in the arts going on around here, and as people get better and better with Zoom, more and more stuff. So Fred Baumgarten writing about Yehuda Hanani and Close Encounters with Music, which, you know, I probably don't know as much about classical music as I ought to. And I think that Yehuda Hanani is probably one of these treasures that we have up here, a, a super beautifully trained musician, very thoughtful, who really wants to bring classical music to us and teach us about it. And Fred Baumgarten interviews him about an upcoming um, concert about um, cello, cello music by Bach. 
um, that makes you feel like, oh, it's so accessible. I get it. I want to do it. Um, David Anthone, who I think people around here know as part of Darn Studio, which is, I would say, a fairly radical art duo, really doing interesting work, very social justice. And I was surprised to discover that he's a state historic preservation officer, which is a very unexpected combination of two sides of his personality. And so he'll be doing a talk on public monuments for the Litchfield Historical Society that is going to be really interesting because here's a guy who's into like breaking down historic patterns, and yet it's also his job to preserve it. And, you know, Public monuments are a really big issue right now for all of us to be thinking about. On um, the winter weekend in Cornwall, uh, in Norfolk is coming up, lots of stuff going on, most of it going on online. Um, and beekeeping, everybody I know loves beekeeping around here. It's one of those things that people love to do when they move up to the country. Some people become very good at it. It's not that easy. Bees are even more complicated than making bread. Um, so two different sets of talks coming up with a lot of in-depth information. One of them starts tonight. I think it's 6 o'clock, um, information on how to log on to those on our website. A.J. Croce, I love Jim Croce. I think I, I assume that everybody else does. I'm, I'm not sure that they do, but, you know, he was alive at a time. He recorded just a couple of albums before he died in a plane crash. There's not a lot of him on the Internet. And it turns out that he has a son who's a musician and does beautiful music and sounds like his father, but is much more interesting even than... You know, in his life, he's much older than his father had been. He's had a lot of tragedy in his life. He, he brings a lot to his music, and so he's doing two concerts for the Mahewi. I I've been listening to him on Spotify. It's very beautiful, very moving, but also very fun. Um, and then the Ripley Waterfowl Conservancy in Litchfield, a really wonderful organization um, that we have a link to um, through one of our advisors, Gavin Berger. And they have these incredible birds. They're called Siberian cranes. And as a fundraiser, they're offering people the chance to name them. So you can watch them on a video at the Ripley website at North Compass. All right. That is uh, our look at uh, the Lakeville Journal this week, of course, available on newsstands, uh, home delivery, and online at tricornernews.com. Guys, we'll speak to you next week. Hopefully there won't be any snow. <laughs> yeah, there'll be snow. All right. Take Thank care. You. Thanks so much. Bye. Uh, that is this week in the Lakeville Journal. Once again, you can find them on the web, tricornernews.com.